I'm Shane Morris. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. Why do so many Americans these days, especially young ones, seem to have a favorable opinion of socialism? So much so that a self-proclaimed socialist is a leading presidential candidate. Well, perhaps they don't really know what socialism is. Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, Dr. Jay Richards gives us not only a solid definition of socialism, but he gives us the history of socialism and explains its flawed assumptions about economics, government, and human nature. Dr. Richards' presentation was one of a four-part online Colson Center short course about preparing for the 2020 election. During the course of his presentation, Dr. Richards refers to a slide of a pie chart referencing the Communist Manifesto. While you probably don't need to see it to follow his argument, we've displayed the pie chart for you at breakpoint.org. Just click on the article about this podcast. Here's Dr. Jay Richards, as introduced by Colson Center President John Stone Street. I'm thrilled to have my friend Jay Richards uh, to uh, lead this conversation. If you have not read his book, Money, Greed, and God, it is a wonderful primer. In fact, if you're dealing with with younger uh, folks in your life or people who are kind of confused about what this is all about, that is a wonderful book to read together with them. It just starts with a, a whole bunch of myths about economics and unmask those myths, uh, unmask those myths as a way to kind of get to the uh, what's really true here. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something that Mindy Belts highlighted last week, which was is the inherent connection between the freedoms, religious freedom and economic freedom uh, and other freedoms. So freedom of association in the press and so on. And that's why that First Amendment is so important. We talk a lot about that on Breakpoint. First thing I want to note about Jay Richards is that he is wearing a suit and tie and I am not. <laughs> And I think that's a very important thing to point out, simply because it's the difference between life in D.C. and life in Colorado, uh, and, and also probably a difference in our personality. <laughs> Jay not only is one of the, the, the brightest conservative minds uh, when it comes to economics, uh, but he's a Christian conservative. He's deeply rooted in, in Christian convictions as a way to ground some of the application points that I think he's going to be talking about tonight. He's written widely on a number of topics in his role, various roles with the Discovery Institute, long time associated with the Acton Institute as well. And uh, most recently, recently and currently the Catholic University of America in his role there as well. And um, Jay, it's, it's, it's always good to have you. Uh, you're, you're a terrific thinker and, and you bring a lot of clarity to it. Mm-hmm. Dr. Richards, I hand uh-huh. it over to you, my friend. All right, great. Thanks so much, John. Uh, Welcome, everyone. And so I want to, in the next 45 minutes or so, I want to help you understand the difference, what, first of all, what socialism is, how socialism differs or is related to Marxism and communism, define all those things, and then try to sort of lay out what I think is actually happening in this current debate. Because as John said, we're in a very unusual moment right now in which socialism by name is actually in being endorsed by the person that in this case may actually become uh, the <laughs> Democratic nominee for president. So I mean, it's an extraordinary moment. It's uh, historically atypical. So here's the sort of difficulty is that when you talk about socialism, you're talking about several different things and you've got these sort of related um, ideas of Marxism, socialism, and communism. And these words, if you notice, they're never actually defined. So I'm sure many of you have seen these polls over the years showing an increasing number of young Americans. So millennials, but now not just millennials, but Generation Z. So basically Americans 35 and under showing uh, more and more interest in socialism, so much so that I think a recent poll that I saw actually said a majority had a favorable view of socialism. Now, this is sort of extraordinary for those of us that remember the Cold War. I was graduating from college just as the Soviet Union collapsed. And so I remember this, I studied it in college, I myself was sympathetic to socialism early on in college because I didn't know anything, honestly, and I read the Communist Manifesto and thought, well, this kind of sounds nice. And so I actually thought Christian socialism made sense, but I kept studying economics and I was a student of history, so I saw what was happening. And so by the time I was a senior in college, it had completely worn off. But if you notice that these polls, when they're asked, they don't start with a definition of socialism. They just ask people, what do you think about socialism? And they allow the person being asked to sort of fill that word with whatever they want. So for instance, a sort of popular uh, politician these days, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whom I think is still too young to actually be able to run for president. She's a representative from the state of, from New York. Uh, 
So this is what she said a few months ago about socialism when somebody was asking her about it in a public forum. She said, to me, what socialism means is to guarantee a basic level of dignity. Now, of course, this is extremely vague. It's the sort of thing that is sort of hard to disagree with. Of course, we would like to have a society in which everyone is in some sense guaranteed a basic level of dignity, where people are treated with dignity and have the sort of means available to them to lead a dignified life. But that's not what the word means. Now, if socialism, all it really meant was just, well, I just think that we're social beings, and so we should care about each other, then we'd be basically be saying, using the word socialism to mean something like solidarity, that human beings have responsibility for each other and we should try to take care of each other or something like that. It wouldn't really matter. But socialism is a very potent and very specific political idea that dominated the 20th century. And so it just won't do to just kind of use these words vaguely. And in fact, if we, do, if we continue to do that, I think what happens is that many people that actually are committed socialists know perfectly well that if they go with a really rigid definition that a lot of people aren't going to sign on for it. So there's a reason rhetorically to do this, to define socialism in these sort of nice, vague, um, saccharine sounding terms that almost no one would disagree with. And then when nobody's looking, sort of import socialist ideas and socialist policies that nobody might want to sign on to otherwise. So what does socialism mean? Well, I think the, the, the best way to figure this out is just Look it up in the dictionary. The dictionary doesn't proscribe what a word must mean, but when you, whether it's Oxford or it's the Merriam-Webster dictionary in the United States, what, what these definitions are is they basically just look and find out, okay, what are the authoritative ways in which this term has been used? And then they tell us. And so good thing about socialism is it actually has some standard definitions. And here they are. So this is a Merriam-Webster, and you can, you can check this yourself. Um, these are the definitions. Okay, so definition one, any of various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods, right? So economic and political theories in which there's government ownership of productive goods, what's often called the means of production. Definition two, 2A, a system or of society or group living in which there is no private property. Definition 2B, a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled, owned and controlled by the state. And then definition 3, a stage of society in Marxist theory, transitional between capitalism and communism, and distinguished by unequal distribution of goods and pay according to work done. So you get already here the, the sense that, okay, socialism, whatever it is, has something to do with government control and ownership of a lot of stuff, either all the productive property in society or maybe even all private property. So there's no private property at all. Um, it also, and if you notice in definition three, is a particular term within Marxist theory. And so there are some socialists that are not Marxist, uh, but the, the most current and common use of the word is in the 20th century was drawn from Marxist theory. So if you want to know what's going on in socialism, you kind of got to know something unfortunately, about Marxist theory. And most of us, unless we've studied it, haven't done that. Now, ask yourself a question, though. If someone, you know, a poll first gave people these definitions of the word, let them spend 10 minutes on it, and then ask them the question, now, what do you think about socialism? Do you think the polls would be different? I'd be willing to bet. In fact, I've thought about commissioning this poll myself and paying for it. I would be willing to bet that those polls would be radically different uh, than what we actually hear. And the reason is because there's a difference between socialism as it's actually defined, that is its actual definition, socialism as it's actually been tried in history and in particular countries in the real world, and socialism as a mental picture. And here's, I mean, half of the problem with dealing with this issue is that whether you're Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or a young college student, socialism sounds nice. No matter how often it's tried, no matter how much disaster it leads to and misery, it sounds nice to people. Part of it is because it has that nice word socialism in it. So we like society. We like to be social. That means interacting with other people. So surely socialism, that sounds better than whatever the alternatives are. And so with a, to really think clearly about this, we have to distinguish socialism as a sort of mental image from socialism as it actually exists. And this is the 
the sort of universal problem because socialism is a mental image. It's usually something like this. It's usually a nice Scandinavian village, like somewhere in Norway. Everybody has a Volvo in their driveway. Everybody has fish and cheese and everything they need. Maybe they get together in the mornings at the local library and they sing together and they work together. And maybe there's a farmer's market, all these kinds of mental images. And if you are thinking of those things, when you hear socialism, you have a very hard time actually analyzing it clearly, right? And so um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, my rarely quote, was right when he said that um, one catchphrase can stop thought for half a century. So one, one little catchphrase, one little clever idea, way of putting something, or one little clever word, if it conjures up a mental image, can prevent people from thinking clearly about any of these issues. And that's what socialism is. It has an almost magical quality for a lot of people. So they don't actually focus on socialism as reality, they focus on it as mental image. So we're going to talk a little bit about socialism as reality. This is Marxist socialism as reality. Anyone that knows the Cold War remembers this. I'll give you some of the details um, uh, later on in the talk. Uh, but in the sort of one corner of the picture, that's actually a, essentially a thatched hut in a Soviet gulag in northern Siberia. The skulls are a stack from a, actually a memorial to the communist experiment in Cambodia. Uh, the image in the bottom corner is actually a massive group of people um, essentially having to leave a city in Venezuela where this is happening right now. All of these are the result of attempts to apply the socialist uh, vision in Marxist theory. All right, now, I want you to sort of do two things at once. Remember that there can be socialists that aren't Marxist. But socialism plays a key role in Marxist theory. Moreover, the versions of socialism overwhelmingly that we saw in the 20th century are a part of a Marxist experiment, all right? So really to get a grasp of this, you gotta define Marxism. Marxism is of course the, the, the political and philosophical views of this man, Karl, Karl Marx, the German, um, who wrote his most famous book with a guy named Friedrich Engels who really barreled his operation in 1848. It's really a pamphlet. I mean, you can read the Communist Manifesto in about 45 minutes. His masterwork that he never finished called Capital or Das Kapital is this highly abstruse um, sort of materialist Hegelian philosophy. And it's, it's actually, you know, there are entire bodies of literature trying to interpret it. But the nice thing about the Communist Manifesto is it gives you his basic theory in a nutshell, and you get the sort of basic idea. And if you follow his argument, you actually get all the kind of core bits of his argument. So let me, let me just sort of describe for you the argument in the Communist Manifesto. Key to Marx's theory is that every stage of economic development, in fact, every society is ultimately defined by conflict between different classes of people. So there's a, in history, in some ways, there's a kind of a Garden of Eden, a creation, a fall, and a redemption. And when you look at communist theory, you can in some ways realize this is really a kind of materialistic Christian heresy. Like history goes somewhere. In fact, it goes somewhere almost deterministically. Um, and, but, and so uh, Marxism was an attempt to sort of account for this stuff, but of course without a Christian God. So Marxist theory is deeply materialistic. Marx's theory is called dialectical materialism. And the basic idea is that it's just the material conditions of society that ultimately determine what happens and ultimately determine what everybody thinks. So if you're in a particular class in a society, you have class consciousness, which means your thinking is determined by your class. Now, any philosophers listening might right away realize, okay, there's already a problem with Marx's theory. And it's this, Every theory needs to be able to be consistent with the theorist, but if everybody's thinking is determined entirely by his class and he can't escape from it, how did Marx escape from it? Marx was an upper middle class guy. How is it that he managed to transcend it? So the very existence of Marx as a theorist contradicts his theory, but let's not, uh, let's not spend a lot of time on that. Um, the basic idea in the Communist Manifesto is that history goes through these main stages. And so in an early stage, you have a slave uh, master slave state. So think of ancient Egypt, right? In which you have a Pharaoh and then you have people that do the bidding of the Pharaoh and then you have this massive slaves underneath it. Rome, Sparta, Athens were the same way. So if you're a Roman or you're a, a, a citizen of Sparta or Athens uh, in the ancient Greek world, you enjoyed a pretty good life because it was based on this massive amount of slave labor. So that was a, an initial stage. And then over time, the kind of internal contradictions of that system 
cause it to destroy itself and give rise to something else. And the thing that followed the slave system is something called feudalism, which you had in medieval Europe, in which you have lords that own very large amounts of land, and then they have serfs or peasants that, that work on and live on the land. They're not exactly slaves, so they're better off than slaves, but they're not also not free. So serfs and peasants weren't free to move around and sort of just buy a farm or sell a farm. They basically got essentially paid rent on the farm of a, of a lord or a duke. Uh, and then the, the lord actually had responsibilities in some ways to protect the peasant. So there were these responsibilities. It was better than slavery, but it certainly wasn't a kind of great emancipation and, and uh, egalitarianism. That eventually gave rise to something that Marx called capitalism. Okay, now, the problem with the word capitalism, it's actually basically a Marxist word. Um, it was popularized by Marx in the 19th century. And so already when you're using the word capitalism, you're in danger of using the word as Marx defined it, because he defined it in a very specific way. And here's what he said. He said, under the capitalist system, you have really these two main classes of people. You have the capitalists or the bourgeoisie. Those are the people that own everything. They own the means of production. They own factories and farms and things like that. And then you have the laborers or the proletariat who are hired by the capitalist and paid a wage in order to work, but don't actually own the, the means of production. That's the basic idea. And that, Marx and Engels said, that's capitalism. And it's inherently exploitive. So that uh, under the capitalist system, the capitalist is always going to be exploiting the laborer and he's gonna to try to exploit customers as well. So here's the basic picture. Um, so you see this sort of pie chart here. Now this pie chart represents the amount of wealth in the hands of different classes at different times. So it doesn't represent the numbers of people. So imagine say in 1700 in England, 99% uh, of the people are laborers and 1% of the population are the capitalists. And so what this first pie chart represents is that of 70% of the total wealth in the economy is in the hands of the laborers, in the hands of the 99%. And then about 20% is in the hands of the rich 1% that own the means of production. So that's the idea. Here's what Marx said happens. And so you get a capitalist and let's say you have a factory that makes shirts. So it's a textile factory. You hire a bunch of workers, you pay them as little as you can to make shirts. And then you take the shirts and you try to sell them out in the marketplace. And you try to sell them for more than they cost to produce. And if you do that, if you had a cost that had to do with the labor cost and you sell it for more than that, the difference is profit, right? It's a surplus. And what Marx called a surplus value, and he called it that because he said, well, it's a surplus value because really the amount that those shirts were worth, their true value was entirely determined by the amount of labor it took to produce them. So that Marx had a particular theory called the labor theory of value in which he said that something is just worth as much labor as it costs to produce it. And so if a capitalist can charge somebody for more than that, then he's ripping off the workers and he's exploiting the, the customer because he's charging more than the shirts are actually worth. Nevertheless, Mark said, he's not going to squander this extra profit or surplus value at a casino. He's going to go back. He's going to reinvest that profit in his equipment, in the factories. And that's going to make the workers even more productive. And so then now they're more productive. They can produce more with less. And so he can fire some of the workers. He can pay the ones that are remaining even less and yet they're more productive because they've got, now got better equipment. And so now he can go sell the new shirts and he makes even more of a profit. And he takes that profit and again, he reinvests it, makes it the workers more productive. And this process continues over and over and over again. And as a result of this, Marx and Engels said, the wealth in the economy will slowly get transferred from this vast hordes of workers in the economy to fewer and fewer of the capitalists because the capitalists are going to, beat each other out and some of them are going to merge and things like that. And so you're going to end up with a few sort of semi-monopolists owning almost everything, um, a very small percentage of the population. And so see, notice that kind of purpley blue, that's the capitalist. So the idea is that maybe over a hundred year period, so now it's England in 1800, these few capitalists own 90% of the wealth in the economy and the laborers, remember the red, that's 99% of the population are just owning a tiny sliver. And what Marx and Eagle say at this stage what do you think is going to happen in Marx's theory? Well, you, you might guess you're going to get a violent revolution. You're going to get a revolution and the, the workers are going to rise up. It's called the dictatorship of the proletariat. 
They kill off the capitalists. And then you have a temporary stage in Marxist theory called socialism. And socialism is the stage that follows capitalism, all right? And in this stage, um, the state owns everything on behalf of the people, right? So in other words, there's no private property. The government owns everything. But the idea is the government is owning everything on behalf of the workers. So you'll often hear communists talk about now everybody's going to, in a sense, gets to own their own means of production. Well, they don't. They're not all little property owners. The state owns them. But according to Marxist theory, this is a temporary stage. This isn't the goal. This is just a means to an end. And the idea was that during the socialist state, um, people would lose their attachment to possessions. They would lose their attachment to families and to children. And a new socialist man, as they called it, would emerge. And then the state would wither away. Socialism would no longer be necessary. And then you'd get this final communist utopia in which there's no state. People live in this kind of preternatural freedom. There's abundance for everyone. And Marx has a famous statement where he says, you know, you can fish in the mornings and you can do literary criticism in the afternoons and then you can smoke and read in the evenings. Everyone's sort of free to do what they, whatever they want to do. There's no specialization of labor. And that's the communist utopia to come. And so if you'd pointed out to someone in the 1970s in the Soviet Union who was a true believer and you said, look, in the United States, we've got all the food we can eat and eat too much, if anything. And then you people in the Soviet Union, you have to stand in line for hours just to get bread. How could this be a good thing? He would have said, yeah, absolutely. Socialism isn't our goal. Socialism is just the means to the communist utopia. And so that's why the Soviet Union was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They understood themselves to be in a socialist stage. And so they were socialists, but they were also communists in the sense that they looked forward to this communist utopia in the future, which, remember, was supposed to be a stateless utopia. Now, any of you that know anything about the 20th century know that that communist ideal never actually happened. It's, we, in fact, have absolutely no idea how we'd ever bring about a world like that. It seems directly to contradict basic common sense. Uh, it seems to deny the fact that there's always going to be scarcity to the side of the kingdom of God. And so every socialist experiment, that is every Marxist experiment, always ended in this socialist state. It never actually moved beyond that. And in fact, nothing like what Marx predicted has ever happened. You never even actually had a workers' revolution where the proletariat raised up against uh, their bosses. What you had is a vanguard of intellectuals like you did in the Soviet Union uh, or in China or in Cambodia who read Marxist literature and then managed to trigger a violent revolution and take power for themselves. Now you might wonder, well, so why didn't this ever work out the way it was supposed to? Well, it didn't work out the way it was supposed to because Marxist theory is wrong in all of its particulars. It's based on a completely confused and universally repudiated understanding of economic value. Uh, it didn't understand the function of prices or supply and demand. There's a really bizarre understanding of the human person as being entirely determined by his economic conditions, so there's no real human nature. It just was not in sync with reality. So needless to say, wherever it's tried, it always fails, and it always ends up bringing far more misery uh, than any that it leaves. But, so what actually happens um, in a market? Well, well, to really get that, you've got to understand this underlying theory of economic value. So I mentioned... Marx has this idea called the labor theory of economic value. So we're at the point, the one kind of difficult abstract point in this, in this presentation tonight. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me for five minutes. Because this is absolutely crucial. Um, I spend a bunch of time on this with freshman business students. Because if you don't understand the nature of economic value, if you don't understand, okay, what does it mean to say that something is worth $15, for instance? What are you saying when you say that. If you don't understand that, it's really easy to fall for the Marxist argument. The labor theory of value just says something is worth however much labor was put into that thing. That's, that's how you determine how much something is worth. Now, there's, this obviously can't be right. Now, we have this intuition that, well, labor of a certain kind can make something valuable, right? But labor by itself doesn't create value. So think about a man, for instance, uh, that spends two days digging a hole somewhere in the desert in Nevada, right? And so he puts a lot of labor into digging this hole in the desert, a heck of a lot of work, right? Now, another man puts in the exact same amount of labor digging a hole in a backyard in Santa Barbara, California, in a place where the owners want a pool, a swimming pool, and have contracted with a general contractor 
to build a pool. And this man is a subcontractor and he's working to put the pool in. So same amount of labor, right? The guy in the desert and the guy in the backyard in Santa Barbara, same amount of labor. Which one is value producing? Well, obviously the one in Santa Barbara. So the same amount of labor can be completely worthless or it can be very valuable based upon the social context. And so, so what makes the labor in Santa Barbara valuable? What makes it valuable is that he's producing something of social value that somebody's willing to pay for. And so the amount, what, to figure out the value of that labor, you actually have to figure out, okay, how much is someone willing to give up in order to get that labor, right? And so the social context, connecting with somebody who wants a pool, connecting with somebody that knows how to build a pool, doing it at the right place in the right time, and then channeling that labor into something that's socially beneficial and that can be paid for, that's what makes it valuable. So it's all the, all, it's the ideas and the coordination that transform uh, labor into value. In the same way, uh, think of the amount of work that the worker can do uh, with a shovel versus the same work that he could do with a backhoe. Now notice no matter who owns that backhoe, that backhoe, his labor is gonna be worth a heck of a lot more than it is if he's just having to use a shovel or having to use a spoon. So this idea that somehow uh, the worker's value of his labor is gonna go down as the tools he uses are more sophisticated is, is just absurd. A worker that drives a tra tractor is gonna be paid far more than a worker that can just use a shovel. And so these are two different economic theories. One was called the labor theory of value that people held for a long time. And in the 20th century, economists realized doesn't make any sense because the same labor can create value in one place and not in another. And so that got replaced by something called the subjective theory of economic value, which doesn't mean economic value is just subjective and relative. What it means is that economic value has to do with subjects. We're subjects. So persons who can evaluate things. And so when we create something of value, we're creating something that's valuable to someone else. And the way you figure out how valuable it is, is how much are people in a kind of competitive environment willing to give up in order to acquire that thing. That's how you determine the economic value of something. Now that's the whole kind of theoretical backdrop of this entire debate. If you listen to people like Bernie Sanders, you'll notice that he still holds that old labor theory of value idea. So that if somebody's working for somebody else, that capitalist has to be exploiting that labor because this is the, you know, the only way he can understand the relationship. He doesn't understand it. Well, actually maybe the employer and the employee both benefit from the arrangement. That never seems to occur to Bernie Sanders. So what actually happens in markets? If you noticed in that, that scenario, right, with the Communist Manifesto, notice the thing that doesn't change in the picture. Notice that pie chart, right? That pie doesn't change shape or size. It stays the same size. So it's a zero-sum game in the sense that if one part of the pie grows, by definition, the other parts of the pie have to shrink. Right? So if one person gets too much, they've gotten more than their fair share and they've taken from someone else. So if somebody gets rich, somebody has to, to get poor as a result. That's the key kind of background assumption. It's the key actual uh, economic fallacy that Marx and many socialists make. And in fact, at the time Karl Marx was writing the Communist Manifesto, the wages of workers in England, two miles from his apartment in London, were going up and not down. How is that possible? Well, it's not actually possible on Marxist theory. So he actually had the evidence against his theory available all along, but he wasn't looking at that. He was making deductions from um, the Hegelian philosophy. I hope you're enjoying Dr. J. Richard's short course presentation on socialism. Four times a year, the Colson Center holds short courses on various topics with outstanding presenters such as Dr. Richards. Our next short course, entitled Responding to Culture's Brokenness, will take place every Tuesday evening in April and tackles such issues as addiction, mental health, end-of-life care, and the breakdown of the family. Each short course is recorded, so if you can't make it on a particular Tuesday, we'll send you a link to the presentation. Come to Breakpoint.org for more information and to register. Now back to Dr. J. Richards. Well, this is what markets really do. I mean, we all know this, but markets... A market economy in which you have not the law of the jungle, but the rule of law, private property rights, limited government, and economic freedom, markets actually grow over time, right? The total amount of wealth in an economy, in a market economy, there may be ups and downs, there may be depressions and recessions, but the total amount of wealth in an economy goes up over time. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because what that means is that somebody can get fabulously wealthy in this kind of economy 
not by extracting wealth that was already there or from somebody else, but by creating wealth that was not there before, by participating in a process of wealth creation, both for themselves and for others. I often joke the late Steve Jobs did not get rich stealing iPhones from homeless people, right? I mean, we know this, but it's easy to forget that and to fall into this zero-sum game thinking. So that's the kind of market reality. That's what things, how things actually work in the economy. Um, and as long as you understand that, you're not going to fall for this idea that, well, so-and-so got rich. They must have caused somebody else to get poor. That seems silly once you realize how markets actually work. But if you, if you doubt that Bernie Sanders thinks that way, just go online and read some of the things he says. This is, in fact, how he, how he actually thinks. And it's how socialists in general think. Now, I'll tell you that even the really smart Marxists and socialists these days try to fix Marxist theory because they know the labor theory of value is false. So the head of Jacobin Magazine, a leading leftist magazine in the United States, and says, look, the labor theory of value is useless. So he tries to patch it up in some ways. The reality is that Marxist theory is entirely based on that idea. All right, so that's why, if you forget everything else, I'm sure you'll remember at least <laughs> this image of the pie growing, right? That's what markets really do. So let's talk a little bit about just the details of socialism, because I said it, um, the Marxist theory uh, isn't in touch with economic reality. It's not only, uh, sort of contrary to that, but just in terms of the kind of basic practicality of what has actually happened in the 20th century. When socialism was tried, socialism was in the 20th century generally tried in the Marxist vein, I'll talk about non-Marxist experiments in a moment, it always and without fail has led to the deaths of millions of people. In fact, according to the Black Book of Communism, which is the, the definitive empirical work trying to tabulate, okay, how many people died in the 20th century just from these Marxist experiments? So not, not in war, um, not counting national socialism and Nazism and fascism, just, just talking about these so-called communist experiments. The death toll was more than 100 million people. So 65 million in China, um, in large part, I mean, that's a lot of people, but it also is because China has a lot of people. So that's partly demographic, about 20 million probably in the Soviet Union that is killed by their governments. North Korea, probably 2 million with small because the country's small. But if you want to sort of focus on like per capita deaths, nobody beats Cambodia. So the Khmer Rouge in the early 1970s in a period of just about three years, probably killed about 2 million of its population, which is between a fourth and a third of its population. Now the Khmer Rouge were French, they went to France and studied Marxist theorists, came back, decided to declare year zero, emptied out their cities, moved people all into the country to work in work camps, killed and murdered uh, mercilessly all of their intellectuals um, and killed, imagine this, in three or four years, between a third and a fourth of their entire population. So when people say, well, you know, socialism hasn't really been tried, of course it's been tried. I mean, can you imagine saying, well, the Nazis were bad, but na national socialism has never been tried. I mean, the reality is that if you look at the apologists for these communist experiments, um, if these weren't real socialist experiments, then why is it that socialists, when these experiments started, always defended them? It's only when the disaster is known that they then say, well, that wasn't real socialism. It's the same thing now with Venezuela. The people that are saying, well, Venezuela is not real socialism, were praising it when it started. Um, and so there's, at some point, this becomes, I think, just delusional to ignore the practical effects of this political philosophy. It just kills lots and lots of people whenever it's tried. And we've got to constantly remind people of that, especially people that have no memory of it, because it's a, it's a matter of sort of telling them uh, about things that happened not that long ago, in, in my memory, at least at the end, but that a lot of people have forgotten. Okay, so I've been talking about the socialism, the Marxist type of socialism, which we often call communism, right? What about democratic socialism? That's a, obviously a different thing. And this is what, um, if you ask Bernie Sanders, for decades, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont has said that he believed in democratic socialism. And that's usually what people often talk about. The idea of democratic socialism is that you get socialism not by violent revolution like you do in Marxist theory, but you get it simply by electing someone as a socialist. So someone is elected, uh, they don't have a violent revolution, and then they implement socialist policies. So what would that be? 
Well, socialist policies would generally be the same kinds of things that, uh, you know, a Marxist socialist would do. You want to nationalize industry, right? So you, you re take private industry of uh, various sorts and you, you essentially confiscate it and put it under the control and ownership of the state. Um, you sold centralized power. You usually drastically increase taxes and things like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you abolish all private property all the way out to the very end. In fact, even in the Soviet Union, when that was tried from about 1919 to 1921, it was such a catastrophe when they completely abolished private property that Lenin actually had to give back some control to the peasants uh, of some of the fruits of their labor. So as before, the peasants were supposed to work uh, and then just give up all the grain and, and, and you know, they'd just be told, okay, we're going to pay you whatever we want to pay you. That didn't work well. And people started starving to death by the millions. And so they set up a system where the peasants essentially got to keep 10% of the value of the grain. In other words, they had to slightly modify the abolition of private property. Nevertheless, they controlled all national industry and things like that. And there had been attempts to do this. There were democratic socialist experiments in Europe after World War II. So right after the end of World War II, uh, the conservative government under Winston Churchill uh, in the UK was voted out of office and Clement Attlee, the, the Labour Party, who was a democratic socialist, uh, was voted in and they started, they implemented this. They started uh, nationalizing uh, various utilities and, and steel factories and uh, various factories in various industries. And the same thing happened in Scandinavia. And so there was a time in the 1970s when about half the uh, property, that is sort of half the total economy in Sweden was owned by the government. So there were attempts at this kind of democratic socialism. Now, if you want to look though at a kind of current example of democratic socialism, all you have to do is just look at Venezuela. People may forget this, but Hugo Chavez was voted into office. So there's nothing that prevents this from happening from a, a socialist getting 51% of the vote, either legally or, or illegally as the case may be. The problem is, is this isn't an obvious improvement. Okay, so maybe we don't have a violent revolution, but the, because socialist policies are contrary to basic economic reality, they always end up having a disastrous effect. And so if you want to talk about democratic socialism, look right now at Venezuela, where it's actually happening in action. They don't even have, they have people are starving to death. People, are, uh, I've been sort of tracking this over the last few years. People are generally malnourished. They're slowly losing weight as a population. They don't have access to normal factory made toilet paper. Um, hyperinflation in the tens of thousands of percent per year. So the Venezuelan money is worth almost nothing. All as the result, and this is a country remember that was generally advanced. It was one of the wealthiest and most developed countries in South America. And in a matter of 20 years, it's been completely destroyed and decimated, again, by a democratic and socialist experiment. So there's no reason. Yeah, it doesn't have a violent revolution, but socialism as a set of policies is still a disaster wherever it's tried. And there's not a good example of this. There's no counterexamples. What about Scandinavian? In fact, when now I've noticed the press has gotten uh, a, a little more attentive to asking Bernie Sanders about some of his policies. Because remember Bernie Sanders, again, it's not critics calling him a socialist. Bernie Sanders is a self-identified socialist. He's, he, is he wasn't even a member of the Democratic Party for the longest time. Uh, he identified himself as a Democratic socialist. And when asked, okay, what do you have in mind? He always points to Scandinavia. But if you actually look at Scandinavia, you realize, okay, this, this isn't right. Uh, and in fact, the Scandinavian countries, they do have large kind of cradle to grave welfare systems. There's no doubt about that. And they tend to have fairly large marginal income tax rates, but they are not socialist by any stretch of the imagination. So Sweden, for instance, maybe 15% of the economy is under the control of the government, 15%. All right. So on some measures, that's less than it is in the United States. What about uh, government-run healthcare. Well, in Sweden, actually, it's not even a national system. The healthcare is actually devolved down to smaller regions. And Sweden, as a whole country, only has about eight million people in it. If you look at the index of economic freedom, so this is produced by the Wall Street Journal and uh, the um, the Heritage Foundation every year. So there's Google index of economic freedom in 2019 will come up. And what it shows you is on a number of measures, basically the countries that are the most economically free are at the top and the ones that are at least freer at the bottom. So the bottom always ends up being some country, usually North Korea ends up being dead last. 
you get China somewhere to kind of to the middle. And then up in the top 15 or 20, you get countries like Luxembourg and, and Sweden or uh, Switzerland and the United States and Singapore and Hong Kong and all of the Scandinavian countries. So the Scandinavian countries, some years, one or two of them will be above the United States in the index of economic freedom. So it's just a myth that these are, uh, that, that these are socialist countries. And in fact, in 2015, the president of Denmark, when Bernie Sanders in an earlier time, or, you know, during the, the, the previous uh, presidential uh, election, Bernie Sanders invoked Denmark as the ideal. And the president of Denmark came out and said, I'm sorry, but our country is not socialist. We have a market economy. Yes, we have a large welfare state, but we have a market economy. In fact, Denmark doesn't even have a, 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 a minimum wage like we have in the United States. So they're not socialist. Um, and that now these countries all did try democratic socialist experiments in the 60s and 70s and all started moving away from it for the same reason that the United Kingdom did, because it basically depressed economic growth and caused productive people to want to leave the country. And so they reversed those things. So again, the, the countries that have actually tried this realize this, this is a bad idea. Even if you do this democratically, if you start nationalizing, not nationalizing industries, you, it blows up costs. It makes industries really, really inefficient, and it destroys the, the, um, the quality of the goods that are produced. So this is just a myth. But let's, let's say that there is a type of socialism. Let's just say, uh, contrary to the fact that the Scandinavian countries were a kind of socialism, even if that were true, it would not follow that we could replicate what they have done in Scandinavia. So these Scandinavian countries are very, very small. Denmark's about 5 million people. So the entire country of Denmark in terms of population is the size of the population of the state of Washington, right? One of one fairly small American state. That's extremely, these countries are extremely ethnically homogenous and share a particular culture that goes back hundreds of years. Right, And so it doesn't follow that you can scale up something that would work for 5 million people in a very homogenous, ethically kind of dense place to a nation, highly diverse nation state of 330 million people that traverses an entire continent. Scale, as any social scientist will tell you, is absolutely crucial. So the types of social interactions you can have in a family right, allow for certain kinds of things that you couldn't have for a whole city or a whole state or a whole country. So there's this idea that, well, we'll just do whatever they do in Scandinavia. Even if it were somewhat socialist, it wouldn't follow that it would, would actually be beneficial here any more than the relationship that I have with my children would be beneficial to people if you tried to do it at the size of a city or something like that. So don't let this, this again, a mental picture of Scandinavia is really what Bernie Sanders in particular is, is uh, depending upon people essentially uh, to think of and, and not actually to look at the details. All right, so Scandinavia is just simply not socialist. So let's talk for a few minutes though about Christianity and socialism. I know there are some progressive Christians, both, both evangelicals and, um, and Catholics that have been trying to argue that Christianity and socialism are either compatible or maybe in fact, Christians ought to be socialists. There was a piece in the, the National Catholic Reporter, which is a very left-wing a Catholic publication that advocates all sorts of crazy stuff uh, a few months ago that had a, an article called the Catholic case for communism. And this guy actually tried to make the argument. Now it's really ridiculous in a Catholic context because popes for a century have been saying that you can't be at the same time a socialist and a, and a Catholic, but people still try to give it a try. So let's just talk for a few minutes about the, the kind of arguments that we tend to hear along these lines. The first one is this, was the early church communist. Most of you know, uh, are familiar with the, the, the events that happened in the early book chapters of the book of Acts. So you remember Acts is written uh, by Luke, who also wrote the gospel, and it's sort of what follows Christ's ascension into heaven. And it starts out at Pentecost. And so Pentecost is this Jewish holiday in which thousands of Jews come from around the Roman world and descend upon Jerusalem for several days. And then during this time, Peter and other apostles preach to the people so that this time, remember, it's just Jews, um, and thousands of them become Christians. The Holy Spirit sends upon them. Uh, people are seen as having sort of uh, tongues of fire on their heads. This is a famous painting by the great painter El Greco of, the, of this moment in which the Holy Spirit descends upon people. They start speaking in tongues. And the tongues they speak actually allow them to speak to each other 
so that they understand each other, even though they don't know, know each other's names or know each other's languages. So there's this amazing moment. There thousands of Jews come from around the Roman world. Suddenly thousands of them become Christian. And then in that context, the Holy Spirit persuades the, pe the local people, right? So the new local Christians who have their homes there and have their possessions to sell their possessions and then to share in common what they have with these other believers. And when people see that, they say, well, that, isn't that communist? I mean, they're selling their stuff. They're not hoarding their wealth and they're, they're sharing with others. Well, now, the, the problem is that we're, we're using really, really slippery words here. Remember, communism, or let's just say socialism, has a particular meaning. So remember, under this kind of communist vision of Marx, uh, in the socialist stage, what happens is that, the, you know, the people rise up and they confiscate private property, right? And then the government owns private property uh, temporarily. So private property is abolished. Now, in the book of Acts, where the Roman... Uh, centurions showing up and knocking down doors and confiscating people's property and selling it? No, of course not. What we had is a voluntary moment in which particular Christians that were local voluntarily decided, okay, under these circumstances, all these new brothers and sisters in Christ who are away from their homes, they're away from their jobs and their families and their possessions. So under that circumstance, it's kind of an emergency situation. If they had to leave and go back, they wouldn't have had time to build up in the faith and, and fellowship together. And so in that very unusual kind of emergency circumstance, it absolutely made sense that the local Christians would sell their possessions and would share among the Christians that were there. This was never held up as a sort of ideal model for how local congregations should exist. If you read Thessalonians or Corinthians or Colossians or Ephesians by Paul, these are letters of Paul to other church communities. He never holds this up as a model. For all we know, this kind of temporary sharing arrangement that they had in the early church in Jerusalem may have lasted six weeks or six months, but it's never held up as an ideal uh, arrangement. In fact, some hints from Thessalonians suggest that maybe uh, attempts to do this are actually people just trying to free ride on the, on the benefits of others. So this is absolutely not communist. It was a small, local, voluntary sharing of possessions in which the people that had things, the local people shared with those people that didn't uh, temporarily so that they could stay there. That's, that's what was going on. And so it's only by a uh, really promiscuous use of words that you would call that communist. Sharing voluntarily, first of all, we're commanded to do that, is not communism and it's not socialism. These are two different things. So no, the early church was not communist. The other thing, so people often ask me, well, but what economic theory would you advocate based on the Bible? And I say, well, it's not like you can read the Bible and say, okay, this is a sort of an economic textbook that's going to give you all the details that you need to know to develop an economic theory, just as you're not going to get the periodic table of the elements, right, from the book of Scripture. So God, there are things that God reveals to us in Scripture that he wants us to know, but he also reveals himself in the book of nature. God has created a world that has particular laws and rules, and uh, we are able to discover it. And so there are things that we discover, truths of economics, uh, that we only learn by experience and by developing economic theory and things like that. Nevertheless, I would say there are some fundamental concepts and issues that are clearly represented in scripture uh, that would lead us uh, at least away from socialism and communism and toward some kind of economic system, call it whatever you want, a market economy or a free enterprise economy or a system in which uh, you have the kind of basic things that you need in order to have a market that works. And the one that's central, really above all of these, is the right to private property. Private property is one of these things that's everywhere assumed, but nowhere explicitly taught in Scripture. There's nowhere, there's not a Bible verse in the Old Testament that says you shall have the right to private property. On the other hand, if you read Genesis, so Genesis is 50 chapters of a book, and it starts with the creation of the universe, and it ends with Joseph and his brothers, in Egypt. And except for those first 11 chapters, you only, there's only a kind of a couple hundred years that takes place. And then right in the middle of this 50 chapter book, there is an entire chapter devoted to Abraham negotiating a deal with some Hittites in the, in the gate of a city to buy a plot of land with the cave of Mamre where he could bury his deceased wife, Sarah. Now it's, a, it's a sort of extraordinary thing. Why would, you, the, why would Moses, writing this, of all the things that you're going to put in here, why would you 
waste an entire chapter on essentially a, a sort of Bronze Age land deal, right? Why, what's, why is that in there? And what's fascinating about it, I'm, g- I'm glad God did that because you get actually all of the elements of uh, what you need for private property actually in that chapter. And I spent a bunch of time talking about that, that passage in my book, Money, Greed, and God. But this basic idea that you can negotiate for a price, everyone agrees to the price, Abraham uh, makes the deal in front of everyone, including the city elders, so that everyone recognizes that he has now justly and duly bought that land. And so it is his uh, for, forever. From then on, it's his land to do with as he wills. Already these kinds of ideas. But notice that private property is, is about the things that human beings do. So if you have land and you have title to land, it's not like when it becomes your property and you have a title to it, Nothing happens physically. It's not like the molecules of dirt in the land change. What, what changes is this kind of symbolic system in which everyone recognizes that it's yours. It's protected by the government. Even the government has to, to compensate you if they want to take it. So it's an amazing thing when you live in a culture that's developed these kind of principles of private property. And you see that right in Scripture. You also see it actually in the Ten Commandments. Again, it doesn't say anything about private property, but two of the Ten Commandments presuppose it. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not cover covet thy neighbor's possessions, right? So both of those presuppose, right? Stealing implies that there are things that justly belong to other people and that you shouldn't take from them. So that wouldn't make sense. Stealing wouldn't make sense unless there are things that people can actually have and own. And then you shouldn't covet the possessions of others. In other words, there are possessions that other people rightly have, and you shouldn't be wishing to have them for yourself. So both of those presuppose private property. And so any system that does not uh, at its very center protect and recognize the value and the importance and the sanctity and the dignity of private property is I think not a system that is compatible with scripture. Now I wouldn't go all the way and say every detail of an economic system you can sort of derive from the text of scripture, but I think that alone is enough to make us Christians always be absolutely wary of socialism. And what's interesting about private property is you can find it in scripture, but you can also study the actual effects of private property. There's a wonderful book written in the 1990s by Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto called The Mystery of Capital. What de Soto says is, you know, what private property is essentially what makes some culture countries wealthy. In fact, he thinks it's the missing ingredient that Latin America lacks. It's really detailed titling and property laws uh, and that's why countries in the North, in North America, the United States and Canada are generally prosperous. And then countries in the Latin, Latin America, there'll be pockets of wealthy, but large numbers of people are poor. So we know both from scripture that it's important and also simply from studying economics that a robust private property and titling system is absolutely essential uh, for the creation of wealth and the creation of financial prosperity for ordinary people. And so we take this for granted because we mostly have it in the United States. Then finally, the reason I think socialism is a terrible idea is the thing that often many popes point, have pointed out in that socialism requires an all-consuming state. Uh, and if, if you're going to have a government that's going to own all private property, that means it's going to be able to tell you how much you're going to get paid, how much you have to pay, um, what job you're going to do, how many hours you're going to work. It's going to dictate the prices of everything, it's probably gonna dictate the terms of, of where you live and your education, absolutely everything. So in other words, every social relation and every association is ultimately defined by the coercive power of a centralized state. That's ultimately incompatible with a Christian society because a Christian society, first of all, is gonna to have to recognize the intrinsic value and rights and dignity of individuals. And so notice that like the 10, the, the, the um, you know, first 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights, these are all about limiting the state vis-a-vis the individual. So the individual has certain integrity uh, that the state can't violate and must recognize. A religious freedom, it's not just a freedom of individuals, it's the freedom of religious institutions and associations and bodies. And so a government has to be limited in order for a church to be able to exist, because a church actually challenges uh, the all overweening authority of the state. The dignity and and freedom and autonomy of the family, the existence of a family balances and challenges an all-powerful state. And so all of these institutions, whether it's the individual, it's the church, 
or families or private voluntary associations or businesses. All of those things are outside the state. And so you, an all-consuming state is ultimately going to completely destroy all of these appropriate uh, human associations that are a part of a, a flourishing civilization. And so the, for all those reasons, I think there's absolutely no reason why Christians should be attracted to socialism. If you're attracted to loving other people or to solidarity or to helping the poor, we should do that and you should do that and you can throw your life into it and there's absolutely no reason that you need Marx and there's no reason that you need socialism in order to do that. In fact, I would argue that socialism when it's ever it's tried always fails and it always fails the very people that it promises to help which is the poor most of all thanks everyone for listening to the breakpoint podcast please remember to come to breakpoint.org to register for our next online short course responding to culture's brokenness for the colson center i'm shane morris